Good afternoon. My name is Alex Gavis. I'm with Fidelity Investments, and I'm moderating this panel on financial or fintech and the use of big data. Um, I'd like to first introduce our panelists. I'm going to uh, primarily just introduce them by their name and their title. Uh, if you'd like more information about our distinguished panelists, you can look in the app. Uh, there's a lot of information about them there. Um, but uh, coming from, uh, I guess, the, the far left of, of me is uh, James Ferrelli, who is uh, Vice President and Head of the Investment Management and Investment Advisory uh, Technology Group at Charles Schwab. Um, next to James is Katie Gordon, who is a Vice President and Corporate Counsel of Prudential Financial. And next to her is Tom Vartanian, who is the Executive Director and Professor of Law for the Program on Financial Regulation and Technology at the Anton Scalia uh, Law School of the George Mason University. And immediately next to me is Elson Yildirim, who is an Assistant Director and Head of the Quantitative Analytics Unit um, at the SEC's OC Division. Um, I'm going to get to the discussion pretty quickly with our panelists, because we've got a lot to cover today. Uh, and we have a, a great group of individuals here um, to, to discuss in this area. Um, with a title like Big Data, um, this panel could go in many directions, kind of the way Big Data can go in many directions uh, in this day and age. But we thought we would focus on a couple of uh, major and significant areas for investment advisors. And we would sort of simplify it by talking about three buckets. One is the collection of data. Two is the control and use of data by advisors. And three is the storage and access of data. Clearly, we're not going to cover all the landscape of, of big data use. But our hope is that through um, a discussion of a couple of uh, different hypotheticals and some questions I'm going to ask the panelists, that will give you a good overview of, of where things uh, may stand when it comes to the use of big data by investment advisors. So why don't we get started here? And we've kind of done it through a series of hypotheticals with some questions. And I'm going to just quickly read the hypothetical, and then I'm going to get to a point of asking uh, our panelists to discuss some of the areas. So the first hypothetical that we have is an investment advisor wants to help its clients understand their financial picture. Uh, to that end, the advisor is seeking to obtain financial data regarding its clients' assets held away from the firm. And the advisor contracts with a third-party technology service provider to collect this data. And the third party uses data aggregation to obtain the data for the advisor, data aggregation. So that's going to be kind of a watchword that we're going to talk about. And I guess I'm going to first turn to James uh, over all the way at the end of the table um, to talk a little bit about data aggregation and what it is and, and why we should think about it uh, and be concerned about it. OK, thank you, Alex. Hopefully everyone can hear me okay. <coughs> That's better. Um, so when we look at the term data aggregation, as we all know, data comes in various sources. It can be emailed to you as a file. You can go and programmatically acquire it from wherever you, your source is. You know, sometimes it comes in a fax or just a document, and the data is contained in that. So really, when you look at the aggregation of all that data, it's being able to structure it, and in some cases, not structure that data. So first of all, you can acquire it properly, and you understand the methodology of how it's being acquired, and then how you store storing that data. And the real power of data aggregation is when you're able to take all this different data in the different forms it comes, bring it together, and present it in a really meaningful way that you can use in your business, you can use for your clients, you can use to make decisions. And you'll hear various terms now, particularly in the technology industry, robotic process automation. People write in these little pieces of programming code to go off and do things, whether it's scrape it from a screen, whether it's take it out of an email and present it. So they're all methods of really acquiring that data. I think as you, as you look at some of the more advanced data providers, they'll say, hey, here's our application programming interface. You come and get the data, obviously providing your license <laughs> for it, you come and get the data that you require. And you can go and get it when you need it at the frequency. Some people push that data to you. They'll say, hey, here's a file. 
hopefully secure file transfer and they'll send you that file and with that data in so bringing that all together as we look at this is so important in getting that full picture of the data and making sure you don't have any gaps and particularly in the investment decision making process that you're making decisions off the correct data so um, I want to turn a little bit um, you know now that we, we think the advisor is collecting data through data aggregation, what are some of the business challenges um, that the advisor would face in aggregating the data? Um, James or Katie, if you want to jump in. I'll, I'll take the technology side and then Katie okay, over to you <laughs> from that. So really, a lot of it is around the security entitlements. So who's entitled to use that data? How secure it is? And then you get into what is the actual quality of the data? So is that data of quality ever, do I need to do a second check? Do I need to reconcile it or verify that that data has the accuracy that I need? And then you start to get into what's the retention around this data? And then that's where it gets into more of the legal aspects of data and regulatory aspects around the data. So to me, they're the biggest challenges you're going to face when you're aggregating that and particularly around client data. So in the investment advisor space, our framework for anything, right, is, you know, what's the compliance program around it? What are the conflicts and how have we disclosed them? Um, how is compliance tested and what records we're keeping? So as James said, first we have to think about how did we get the data? What are the entitlements of the data? Uh, if we're getting the data from an affiliate, for example, did we have permission uh, from the client to get data and reach over to a, a corporate affi um, affiliate and get the data? Um, sometimes there's specific uh, rules around data, like biometric data. You know, there's specific state law around that. Uh, there's a cross-border law now, GDPR, that we have to think about. When we get data, you know, we might be looking at data on our screen in North Dakota, but the data actually came from France. So now we have a cross-border issue with our data. Are we looking at employee data? The employees can be our clients also. And so do we have labor law or ERISA issues? Is it 401k data? Is it a plan asset, for example? Um, is, uh, is there HIPAA data involved, you know, in, in embedded in some of this data? So we've got a lot of different um, compliance regimes that we have to consider. And, you know, is it the data of a joint account? Did the joint account holder give permission, entitle us to use that data? If we have uh, data from an outside vendor, for example, there's different mechanisms like screen scraping or APIs, and there's particular risks to using that data. You know, is, is the client um, inputting passwords into our system to, to access an aggregator company, for example? And, and what's the security around that? Um, what's the cybersecurity and control structure of any vendors that we choose to use to aggregate data to bring into our systems? Um, have we disclosed those practices? Is it, does it rise to the level of an ADV? You know, and, and ultimately, the client has a right to know how we're using their data and what we're doing with their data and where we're getting, you know, who else has access to their data? Um, are, have we disclosed it in our contracts? And you know, for example, in our systems, if we have a, a, a user experience that's online, uh, do we have a just-in-time disclosure before the person uses this aggregator or this other third party to aggregate data? Do they know what they're doing when they input a password or they input password, for example, to their bank so their bank can pay, can wire money into their, into their advisor account? Um, does the client know what's going on and has the client received you know, disclosure about um, the privacy policy, for example, of that other entity? Sometimes these aggregators are not regulated parties and we're choosing to use them as our service providers and have we vetted them properly? Have we you know, done our due diligence on who this, who this party is? And do they retain our client's data? Uh, do they retain our client's data in an anonymized format? Or do they, uh, you know, we use a service provider to wire money, for example, like I said, into our bank account. Does that third party aggregator hold on to our data? What do they do with it? Um, also, what do you have permission to do in the aggregation space? Uh, you collected the data for a particular purpose. Are you keeping within that purpose? You almost have to have your privacy policy right there with you and make sure that any, pur any new purpose fits in with your privacy policy or you're gonna have to make amendments. Um, we talk a lot about uh, data lakes. Sometimes there's all kinds of aggregated data imported on a, from different affiliates into a big, huge pool of data. And does your company have, you know, what are the permitted elements of, of that pool of, you know, who's permitted to use those data sets? 
Uh, do you have an audit function to make sure that everybody stayed within the rules? And if there's lots of different affiliates that are tapping into that data, are they tapping into anonymized data? Or are they tapping into data that has PII all over it? And, and are you permission to use it? And are you disclosing, again, are you disclosing these practices um, into uh, uh, regarding that data? And, and uh, Katie, just to follow up, um, is it sort of a legal or compliance role that would ask those questions? Who would be asking those questions? Or is it really a business sort of function the business should think about? I think it's a partnership, really, because you have the business need of using the data, right? But then they have to, you really have to create a, a structure around how that data is going to be used. So you're going to need, again, sometimes there's speci specific laws and regimes, international regimes you need to worry about, so you need legal. And then compliance has to make sure that folks are actually, you know, keeping within the rules uh, so the company, you know, doesn't, doesn't have the risk. You know, so, you know, we, if we get third-party data, are, are we disclosing the use of it? Uh, are we uh, verifying, you know, we could talk about it, consolidated reports and aggregation if, you want, if we have time. I don't yeah, know. Yeah. Uh, well, let's, let's, you mentioned sort of legal obligations, so I want to turn to Tom and give him a chance to speak in terms of the kind of legal obligations that advisors would have um, with respect to data coming in from third parties and, and the like. Great. Thanks, Alex. Uh, I've been an academic only six years of my life. I spent 42 as a practicing lawyer, so I wear my lawyer's hat today. Um, how many of you have seen the movie Interstellar? All right, so you, I equate a lot of this stuff to the movie Interstellar. I've seen it seven times. I still don't think I've seen everything. It's a mind-expanding movie, and you start thinking about things very differently when you think, put it in, in context of the cosmos. And I won't go any further than that for you astrophysicist buffs out there. But it is, anybody who hasn't seen it, I would really recommend it, because it's the 2001 space odyssey of this generation. And it really sort of is mind-expanding. And that's what I think we have to do when we're thinking about big data because we sort of jump over a lot of issues uh, and, and, and forget that they're out there. And Katie, I think, gave us a good list here of things that we have to focus on. If you're thinking about legal liability, there's three things I think you have to really look at fundamentally. One, whose jurisdiction applies? We dealt with this problem back in the 90s when I was the chair of the Cyberspace Law Committee of the ABA. We wrote a report involving 20 countries where we actually tried to parcel out jurisdiction on the web. Uh, and now it's sort of become a commodity and a non-issue. But the second question is whose agreements are in place and whose agreements are controlling what? And thirdly is what's the developing case law? And when you look at the developing case law in this area, it's all over the place. So you just can't sit down and say, well, the law is, here's what we have to do. Fundamentally, you're at risk when you're using big data, and you've got to take some informed risks, and you've got to make some informed judgments. Um, there's a fundamental question out there that everybody seems to, to, to sort of jump over. And I'm reading this book by uh, Shoshona Zuboff from Harvard. Uh, it's a fabulous book. It's called The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. And her view is that the capitalism we now are seeing is capitalism that's driven by data and information. And she raises an interesting question. She says, if we're talking about the use of data, we've skipped over a very big issue. And that is, did somebody have the right to collect that data? We're talking about how to use it. Question is, did they have the right to collect it? And I think it's an interesting question. Because when you go out and you buy big data from a, from a data vendor, you're not buying a desk. As Jim and Katie sort of suggest, there's a lot of permutations and a lot of issues you have to think about uh, when you're going out there to, to buy that data. It, suppose the data was, was, was created from screen scraping. All right, what's the law on screen scraping? Well, the law on screen scraping is pretty up in the air right now, depending on what jurisdiction you are. It's interesting, I think, that you get major companies like QVC and LinkedIn who are now suing vendors who are scraping their sites for data and losing. Mm -hmm. And they're losing because the courts have said, you didn't put anything in your agreements to protect yourself. So don't come to the court to protect you from people who are aggregating data from your sites. Um, and then sort of what I, I call the, the mind expanding issues here uh, are some of the questions uh, that you have to think about. I call them the upper birth questions. After you go through the basic issues, 
For example, there's some discussion about when uh, big data can be MNPI. What's in that data? Um, you know, that data is being gathered by the internet, through the internet, drones, social media, uh, all kinds of things, satellites. Everything's going into that data. You've got to know what's going into that. You've got to test it. You've got to analyze it. You've got to have some standards and some policies. Um, is, is artificial intelligence a, a legal person? Is it going to be a legal person under the law? Um, another interesting question that, that I've been looking at is, and there's uh, some stuff written on this, is whether big data can be a proxy for anti-competitive activity and anti-competitive data. When everybody's using the same big data, does that raise antitrust issues? And some of the antitrust lawyers are thinking about that. Um, and, and so I think as a lawyer, you've really got to look at this and you've got to be very careful. And what I do and what I used to do when I was advising clients is I would say, assume the worst scenario that you can imagine and assume it happens. What would you want to have done before it happened to be able to answer to your customers, your regulators, and everybody else about what you did. Maybe you can't prevent it, and maybe you can't stop it, but maybe you can create a record that said, I did everything prudent in order to stop that from happening. And that's the way I think you have to start now in this Wild West. So Tom has thoroughly scared us a little bit, but. Um, <laughs> well, after lunch, I don't but think I back, scare you anymore. Well, that's true. Coming back, yeah, that's true. It's it's to the book. Coming back from space um, and 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 larger issues. What about? Um, let's just stay with this hypothetical a little bit and say, okay, so we're talking about client data and pulling in client data. Um, maybe a client's you know assets held away, information about it. But what about other streams of data? Clearly, advisors bring in market data. Uh, data around uh, for portfolio analytics, um, you know, data obviously is coming in through license agreements, but um, Katie or James, what, <laughs> I'll throw it to either of you, you can jump, either one can jump in, but what should, what, any any minute or two thoughts on that? Other. Yeah, it's, it's certainly interesting, Alex, because if you look at the forms of data being created now, this goes from visualization, so that's satellite imagery, looking at certain things that's getting transformed then into data <clears throat> in certain cases that is, is used in the investment process and how it's working. So when I look at those sources, and it, it goes back to the lineage, if you've heard that terminology of the data. So you've got to be able to track all the steps that data's taken, because then you ac actually can say, okay, I mean, within the contracts I've signed, you know, I'm licensed to use it. This is how I'm allowed to distribute it or non-distribute it. You'll see a lot of firms now, if you take the big market data providers in our industry, they are targeting firms to say, okay, you bought this data from us, you've paid for it, but you've actually distributed it to another legal entity in your firm, which you should have not done, et cetera. So it's being able to track the lineage of where the data's come from and then how it's being used is so important, you know, and. If you, when you're deriving that, particularly in investment analysis, to me, and as we tend to look at it, is how we retra retaining that history, how we understanding that history, and what does that mean? Because when you're asked a question, you have to be able to go back to answer that question, and that's the most important thing. Right. And look, you start to go into these other data streams, the more real time you want to take that data, the more expensive it becomes. Absolutely. All right, so let's let's move on to the control and use of data. So the data is now with the advisor, and the investment advisor plans on combining the aggregated data and the data co collected uh, directly from clients to feed into an investment analysis tool. We all know about those. The tool will use a proprietary algorithm invented by the advisor to optimize clients' portfolios. Various employees at the advisor will have access both to the pool of data and to the tool allowing them to run the investment scenarios and analysis. Um, now the data is in the, you know, it's in the confines of the advisor. The advisor's got this tool. The advisor is now going to combine, you know, outside data, inside data, use it with the tool. Kind of a common scenario. Most people probably, um, you know, have, have seen that. Um, why don't we, again, um, may, maybe Katie or James, in terms of testing, data testing, cleansing, and other techniques, the data is now in the advisor. Should there, 
should there be some activity going on with respect to that? Yeah, certainly. So I think hopefully everyone's heard of, you know, data management, data governance. Regardless, you're still responsible for that data and how you use it as a firm. That's the most important thing. So how you govern that data, how you do it. And, and it starts from the very basics. And I'll give you a great example. What I call a certain piece of data may be different to what someone else calls it. So getting a common understanding of that data and the terminology you're using mm -hmm. across your companies is so important. That will make it more efficient and make it easier to govern from day one. And then when you get in, when you're starting to source, whether it's third party, whether it's your own data you're storing, how you're managing that and how the tools you're using, the exceptions that occur, there are tremendous still, even if you source the best data and pay the most money for it, there will still be exceptions. So then how do you correct those? How do you identify those errors? How do you correct them and make sure they're not flowing into your business workflow, into your analysis tools, if you're making investment decisions? So all that pre-work has to happen. You can automate it, and there's certainly tools out there in the marketplace that do that. I think Tom touched on artificial intelligence now with the machine learning capabilities. There's a lot more intelligent ways of identifying the problems with the data and having then a human look at it and identify and do the follow-up on that but it's, it's really being able to master it and govern it and, you know, and creating that data dictionary will certainly help as you go forward and particularly for bigger firms, the amount of data you use and they, it, it just creates a bigger problem if you're not all having that common understanding. So in this space where technology is changing rapidly, sometimes, as we noted, there's no right answer. Sometimes it's just the best answer you can come up with in the moment you know, given the structure and the information you have. But without those generally, and under the Advisors Act, you, know, you, you want to create a governance structure around any kind of algo, whether it's a, an algo that will help you do compliance better, or it's an algo that will help you analyze portfolios, or it's an algo that will help you actually with trading, or, or, you know, whatever other function within the advisor. Um, what's the governance structure? Who approves it when there's modifications and amendments? How are those approved? Make sure it's not just cherry picking, you know, if it's a portfolio uh, decision maker. Is the staff that's qualified and understands the methodology, you know, it, the staff that's making the decisions or, or weighs in on those? Um, are you reviewing your assumptions, your methodologies, your hypos, your back testing, your Monte Carlo assumptions? I mean, all of that can come in with a lot of baked in biases that you might not be aware of. And on compliance of law, we may not know, you know, how they created the widget, but we have to, you know, ha we have to get into the weeds now. Uh, even though that's probably for some of us not, not our not our daily work, but we, we have to know in order to disclose the conflicts, in order to create the compliance program around it. Um, if you're creating a brand new algo of something new, something that hasn't been analyzed before, the data you're using, you know, are you do you have third party testing? Sometimes that's appropriate. You know, sometimes you you, you think that you, your business thinks they've created the great you know analytic tool and you take it to a third party and maybe there's questions that, that aren't answered or biases that are just embedded in your, you know, in the business that, that, that you weren't aware of that you might need to disclose and you might need to mitigate. Um, it's a little futuristic right now. We don't use, uh, not as, you know, typically we don't use machine learning, for example, to, to, uh, to uh, um, analyze portfolios, analyze your trading, make discretionary decisions for you. We're not there yet in our industry. But we could be there, right? So if we're there, if we're going to create those kind of programs in the future, it's a little futuristic. You know, what are the assumptions? How, how does the tool work? What's it going to do? And have you tested it? And have you made sure that it works? Uh, regulators are concerned, and, and maybe Elson can speak to this, that sometimes with these algos, you know, it's, it's, it's not that when you do something by hand, it might be, you know, 10 or 12 or 20 clients or a number of clients. But when something's replicated in an algo to your entire you know client base then you've got 10,000 problems instead and, of you know just one and that's a great segue I mean we, we that's sort of the um, outside view in terms of you know a firm looking at the algorithms but I want to give Elson a chance to talk a little bit about sort of the SEC view uh, in terms of this sure uh, hello everyone and I uh, need to start with my legal disclaimer the views are entirely my own, do not reflect the commission or its staff. Um, and I'm not a lawyer either, so definitely uh, you, can, you can plug one ear. Uh, so um, 
Many interesting topics, and I'll certainly uh, dovetail and, and second what Katie said. I mean, if the, in the first place, if you are, if your investment process involves uh, a certain kind of sophisticated modeling or a certain kind of structure, uh, it, it is strange if you, if an outsider, an auditor, or a regulator goes in there and sees a compliance staff that is trying to do their best but doesn't actually have uh, e enough of an understanding of what's going on. And I think in that sense, that's actually the biggest takeaway I would, I would take away, uh, I, would, I would point out in, in what Katie, Katie said. It's that um, you need to have a certain kind of, it's, it's almost like having a risk management department that doesn't understand what the trading is doing. I mean, the risk managers in a, in a, in a trading business might not be able to trade. They don't have that much, they are not the traders, but they need to have an understanding of the parameters around the strategies, what markets uh, could unleash, and that's that's the job. And and the sort of the analogy in the compliance world is uh, compliance and legal uh, need to have an, uh, sort of an understanding at sort of a, a reasonable level uh, of weeds, let's say, of what it is that's going on in the program, so they can effectively uh, uh, control it. And then you know that that applies to even from the 90s onward to the uh, quantitative uh, investing in industry. But then now we have uh, the brave new world of machine learning and or AI, quote unquote. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure hardly anyone would, in this room would agree on what we mean by AI, but let's, let's just loosely use the word. Um, that brings its own issues. Uh, you know, as, as, as Tom mentioned, is it, is it a legal person? I mean, you know, hopefully we're not there yet, but maybe. <laughs> but, um, you know, let's say, let's think of a simpler scenario. Let's say there is a uh, machine learning or AI type model and something goes wrong in that model. Uh, you won't be able to point out the error in the way you would be able to point out in a very sort of more uh, traditional model because it might be there might be hundreds of nodes and one of them is sending a signal of some sort and you would be to say, well, it's this node 153, but I don't really know what it means because the, whole, the, the, the meaning of it is only in the whole. It's like, you, it's very hard to troubleshoot models of that sort. And then I think that sort of combines with some of the concepts James uh, talked about, like how did you develop that model? At that point, you know, the assumptions, the inputs you used and the parameters around it become important as well. So maybe I'll, I'll uh, bounce back to, to Katie for a second in terms of um, how do you build a compliance program? I mean, how do you get the compliance people up to speed on very complicated algos or algorithms for, you know, an investment tool that's using, you know, large amounts of data? I mean, what, what's the structure there? We've created, you know, different data analytics programs, uh, uh, different entities uh, uh, that I worked with or advised as, as outside counsel. And typically what you do is you get, sometimes you, you may need the deck folks in the room because no one else can tell you what they built. They, they built the mousetrap and you have to know what exactly they built. So you, you need an elementary understanding of what, is, what does it do, what is it intended to do, and in your testing, what have you done? Did it work the way it was supposed to? Um, and can you evidence that testing that you actually evidenced, you know, and you stress tested whatever that algorithm is, whatever that function is, whatever that analysis is, to make sure that it actually did, it did, you know, actually have, you know, warranty of, you know, th did it actually do what it was supposed to do? Uh, uh, so the compliance structure around it is the governance, you know, who created it, how was it created, how was it approved, um, do the people creating and approving have an understanding and do they have the knowledge and background, as I said earlier. And, and it bears out in the testing that it actually do what it was supposed to do. And then you continue looking and is there new uses of it and are those new uses within, within keeping with what the product was intended to do? Or are you now stretching the analysis so that it, it doesn't bear relationship with what you intended and now you're going to have, you know, um, perhaps outcomes that aren't, that aren't consistent. Do you need to hire compliance people who have a coding background too, or do you get that deep? No, we don't. We don't get that deep. But there, you'll always find compliance people more techie than others, okay. and so <laughs> more or more into you know cloud issues, more into you know uh, the the tech issues than others, and that's and that's what you have to really look for. So I want to turn to Tom and um, hear, let's hear a little bit about where you think, you know, the regulatory environment's headed in this area, particularly as it relates to, you know, the use of machine learning and, and, and AI. 
um, and then the feeding in the big data? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so it's a little, let's go back to the interstellar uh, uh, Maybe I should show it up here. Should I comparison? Yeah, get it's, only, it's Net only Netflix on. It's only two hours and sixty minutes, fifty minutes long. So, it's, um, but in that movie, there was a lot of discussion about black holes and the fact that gravity warps time and space. And I, I really think we're in sort of that warped period when nobody understands exactly where we're going, how we're getting there, and we're being inundated with lots of data and lots of input and lots of issues all the time. And uh, I was in a meeting this morning with government officials and, and I said, look, as a former regulator, I would, I would tell you this, that the regulators are light years behind what's happening. Uh, and in some respects, that's good. And in some respects, it's very bad. Because on the one hand, technology equals innovation. And you want innovation to be captivated and nurtured in the markets. On the other hand, the technology we're looking at uh, in terms of big data, uh, add-on uh, cryptocurrencies and artificial intelligence, you're dealing with something that if you wait too long to jump in, you've lost control. And that really is what the stakes are about right now. So with artificial intelligence, I mean, I think you have to have regulators who know when to jump in and what to do when they jump in. Because if they jump in too late in the financial services business, you may have lost the economy. Uh, because on the flip side of this stuff, and, and if you take what, what the luncheon speaker was talking about to its ultimate con, uh, you know, end, uh, all you need is one rogue nation and one fanatic uh, with control of artificial intelligence and big data to do a lot of damage. Um, and so I think the regulators have a really, really difficult question before them. Um, it's interesting, back in the, in the 90s, um, when we were trying to do online banking and electronic money, um, the regulators are pretty negative on electronic money. Uh, they didn't want any anonymous currency. And it's interesting how they've sort of faded back now and let Bitcoin and there's 1,500 cryptocurrencies out there, so they're obviously flourishing. Um, but I, I think the key is going to be, when is the first disaster? And then you're going to see the regulators rush in with an enormous force. So that gets me back to the ultimate question that, again, I raise with people in, in, in this context. And that is, assume that that disaster has happened. How would you want to be ready for the regulators when they walk in? What do you want to be able to tell them? Do you want to be able to tell them you've got policies in place, you did due diligence, you had contracts? That's the kind of stuff you've got to think about before it happens. And it may not happen to you. The disaster may be to a competitor, but you're going to be asked the questions and you're going to be put on the spot. And I think with all technology, what we have learned in the last 30 years in this, this greatest sort of influx since the Internet took over is that the survivors, particularly in financial services, the survivors are those who anticipate the regulation that's coming. And so a friend of mine just went to become general counsel of a very large, large digital exchange out in San Francisco, and they've decided that if they're going to do work with financial services companies, they're going to hire people who understand financial services, former regulators, people in, this, in the business, so that when the regulators come out and finally say, well, what happened here? they'll be talking to people who speak their language, and they think there's a lot of value in that. So I think, I think the, the worst is yet to come in terms of regulation right now. I think the regulators are learning uh, just like everybody else is, and I think they're lagging behind, but regulators have the choice to move as fast as they want whenever they want. Alex, can I amend my? Sure, yep. So if you're in this space and you, and you know you want to, you're into algos, big data, AI, you know, machine learning, et cetera, then you're going to have to staff up and your, and your compliance people are going to have to know it. I mean, that's ultimately the answer. Yeah, I, and, and I guess, Tom, a, a follow-up um, and just a, a minute on there, too, is isn't, isn't there an also an issue around what is the definition of AI, right? I mean, on the one end, I mean, a lot of advisors and, and firms have been using uh, tools, investment analysis tools, which are sort of, you know, big data in, inputs in, outputs, and now, you know, maybe those tools are learning tools, so they're getting better 
And then, you know, there's obviously the other end of the spectrum, there's the singularity where you have actually, you know, a thinking machine that, that, that gets away from actually real people doing something. But we're not there yet, right? No, we're not there. And, and interestingly enough, the terms are used rather sloppily right. by all of us. And, and I think that's because nobody really knows what they want, how they want to define any of this. But I, I think what we're really dealing with at this point is some sophisticated machine learning. Uh, which is basically searching for patterns. And as a former philosophy major in school, I learned the difference between inductive and deductive reasoning. Uh, and, and right now, I think we're at a very sophisticated, at a, at a level of machine learning. Artificial intelligence includes a lot of these things, machine learning, deep learning. The ultimate artificial intelligence is what's called AGI, artificial general intelligence. And that's the way the human brain works, right? We're not there yet in any, in any form or fashion in terms of deploying that in a business sense, but we will get there. We will get there, and when we get there, you, will, you should have read a book by Max Tegmark called Life 3.0, When the Machines Take Over. Uh, I used to think the movie, well, the movie Matrix was complete nonsense. Can a machine have a fiduciary duty or understand what a fiduciary is? <laughs> I'm not gonna, you're not going to have to answer that one. Um, all right, so let's move on um, to the to the third chapter, um, and then we're going to have a lightning round where folks can uh, kind of talk more we, freely. We hit by lightning, is that that, right, right. Um, uh, the storage and access of data. So the investment advisor that we've been talking about, and I couldn't think of a really funny name for an advisor that wasn't already used, um, is planning on using a, a software as a service, a SaaS provider that hosts the investment analysis tool that we talked about. Further, the advisor. Um, will uh, uh, contract with a cloud service provider who has both onshore and offshore operations to store and maintain the client data from both the aggregated and the data collected from clients. Um, so here we are in sort of cloud land, or we're up in the clouds, right? Um, and again, I'm, I'm going to turn over to, um, let's uh, turn to James to talk a little bit about sort of the due diligence that should be conducted or what, what should we be thinking about when we're hiring a cloud service provider? And, uh, and, then, and then maybe, Katie, you can add on to that. that. No, certainly. So I think the first step of the process is to understand how that software is being deployed in the cloud. Cloud is a generic term. Is it a third-party cloud? An Amazon, a Microsoft, a Google, or is it their own private cloud in their data center? So really going to take a big step back at the infrastructure. And the reason I say that is, depending how that software is deployed, that really determines where liability sits. So is the liability sitting with the Amazons of the world who provide us all great cloud services, or is it actually with that service? And I can tell you just over the last couple of years, as this space has really matured on the due diligence around cloud providers. Contractually, that's where it's becoming a problem because they'll say, hey, we're deploying our software, but you know, we're not responsible for it. And you, you have a contract with them, but maybe underneath you don't have that contract with that cloud provider. And that really becomes the challenge. If something does go wrong, <laughs> where's the accountability and the liability, I think is the first thing. There's some great, there are standards formalizing across the industry, whether it's ISO standards, obviously for any cloud providers who are hosting government data, there's very, very strict standards around that. So understanding what standards they're conforming to and how, how they're conforming. And then I think you look at, you know, what data are they publishing? What that software, they are providing software as a service. There's some great advantages. You don't pay for all the infrastructure costs. It's there, it's available. But what is, in, what is in com, encompassed within that service and what parts of that service are you actually going to use are very important. And I don't know if you want to add anything, Katie. Yeah, I, I, Katie, do you want to talk a little bit about the risks and, mm -hmm. and uh, sort of, of sure. hiring cloud service providers? Sure, so in the advisor's act space, we usually have an underlying uh, broker dealer who's custodian and settlement, you know, uh, a custody settlement execution, that person, that entity is either affiliated or not, but that entity has a number of regulators uh, that look into that entity and, you know, we're dealing with a regulated party. Here in the cloud space, we're not dealing with regulated providers at all. So, uh, you know, we're, and sometimes they could be major provider to us. So we have to think about, you know, we're dealing with an unregulated entity 
and there's only a, if you're going to have a, a public, go to, go to the public cloud, there might only be five or six providers worldwide who might be able to provide a service to you. So you have to think about that. Then you've got to think about, you know, what are we going to put on the cloud? Are we going to have uh, d client data on the cloud? Think about the sensitivity of that, or just apps and, and you know, uh, software on the cloud. Um, and, you know, James mentioned the, the uh, information security standards. Um, you know, you have, uh, you might be the investment advisor rooted in the U.S., but you have info on the cloud that's also used by one of your affiliates who's regulated by a different regulatory scheme. And, you know, and, and does, does your, um, your cloud contract consider all of the different regulators that you're going to have to deal with, with, with the data that's up there? Um, data privacy, security, think about data loss, data breach, outages, bankruptcy. Um, and think about the information barriers you're creating depending on what, uh, who has access to your data up on the cloud and what kinds of, you know, control environment you created for that, for that data. Um, you have to think about, you know, what, what contractual warranties, you know, are we using encryption, are we using our encryption, are we using their encryption, are we using third party encryption? Um, you have a BCP obligation under many different regulated, um, many different uh, regulatory uh, regimes, you know, how are you going to have a resumption of service if your, if your apps, your website, or whatever it is, is on the cloud? Do you have an exit strategy? You don't like the cloud provider anymore, you want to go somewhere else, when do you get your data back? Um, how do you, you know, how do you, when and how do you get it back? Um, what are the limits of accountability? James talked about that, you know, the, the uh, limits of liability. Uh, who owns the data? When you leave, do they keep any of it? Make sure you know you know what's going to happen with with the, with the data when you go. And, uh, and and on that one, is there a, a worry also that maybe the cloud service provider gets some sort of aggregated? Uh, precisely. What data? are they? Yeah, can they use it? Are, do they have anonymized data, or do they de-identify de data, or do you have PII up there? You know, did you think about that? Um, the geography, and you know, you've got overseas litigation. A lot of these data. Um, Th these cloud providers may be overseas, is your data overseas? Are you allowed to have under your regulatory regime data overseas? Uh, sometimes, in some countries you may not be able to. So, you know, you might be operating in a country that requires data to be in a particular country and have, you know, have you thought about that? Um, you can, if you get into litigation or a regulator asks for the data, can you subpoena the data in some other country? Um, can you, uh, do you have audit rights to find out whether they've been using your data, have access to your data, have done anything with your data? And, and whether they're, you know, if you have a regulator that requires data to be held, held in a particular way, you know, are you, uh, you know, uh, are they, can they keep to your regulatory standards? And let's, uh, that's a great segue, because let's turn to the regulatory, uh, you know, issue, or, or how regulators would view sort of the use of cloud service providers. Elson, you want to give us some thoughts on that? Uh... I mean, on the SEC side, uh, there's been some experimentation with clouds for ourselves using the cloud. Um, there's federal data on uh, cloud prov providers. I believe it's 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 a very slow process. Uh, you know, the the growth there has been uh, very risk averse, understandably. And uh, uh, there's some experimentation, but uh, to a large extent, uh, we're not there yet in terms of using it ourselves. In terms of registrants using it. Um, I, I I haven't been on an examination where it's been an issue yet, but that's largely because that quote unquote disaster hasn't happened yet. Or if it has, I, I don't know about it. Um, I, I'm sure there's uh, plenty of issues around that. That said, um, no data is ever safe. And you know, in-house in data is not necessarily safe either. Th those are uh, hacked well uh, and, and, and often. So there's, there's really, uh, there's no, no basic answer on that. And uh, on the, on the uh, yeah, so I'll just, I'll just well, leave it there. I guess I'd, I'd follow up and say, are, are there, um, maybe not standards, but are there expectations by the SEC around the <laughs> due diligence of cloud providers? In other words, that the, the, if, if an advisor is hiring a cloud service provider, that it would have gone through certain steps or could demonstrate that it went through certain steps. I would guess so. I think you've answered your own question beyond what I could have. Right. That's that's kind of outside my uh, okay. wheelhouse in the SEC. Okay. okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, and and 
the, the other area to think about with the cloud is, you know, all of the sort of privacy regulations and privacy laws that are coming out um, and ones that are already in place, such as the California Consumer Privacy Protection Act. Um, Katie, anything to say in, in, in that regard or, or sort of worries in that? Yeah, I think if you were in law school right now, I'd say study cyber, study privacy, because uh, this is going to be the next thing. Um, there's a flurry of activity from different regulators. California started, and that law is in flux. Uh, it might change. Um, but it seems like GLBA um, is out of scope, but for their anti-fraud provisions um, and the privacy, private right of actions, GLBA may be, may be back in. We're, we're waiting to hear you know, the definitive on that one. Uh, it's a moving target, uh, honestly. And then if, you, if you're in this space, Compliance and law have to be nimble and have to be conversant with the technology and conversant with the ever-changing laws, and you know again cross-border laws and all the specialty laws depending on what you what you're involved yeah, in. Yeah, and, and I guess I'd say so. An example on that is um, you know with the GDPR and then obviously with the California statute, consumers are increasingly been given a right to have their data deleted. Yeah. And so all of a sudden you have that requirement, well, your cloud service contracts may not necessarily have a deletion function or a, a way in which you can get that data sort of um, expunged. And so you may have to go back and amend those contracts for that particular provision. That's just an example, but you've got to kind of monitor what your rights are and your obligations are, and then monitor the cloud service uh, you know, agreements that you've got and make sure you're keeping track and amending those as necessary. Um, I want to turn a little bit in this area to sort of uses of new technologies. Obviously, um, the blockchain is used, um, you know, to solve everything from, you know, cancer to uh, <laughs> to <laughs> to to uh, maybe record keeping. But but Tom, um, you want to give us some thoughts on that in terms of the use of new technologies? Yeah, I'm trying to use blockchain to increase my batting <laughs> average. Uh, it's not worked yet. So, um, look, I mean, I think. I go back to what I said before, that we're at the front end of whatever revolution uh, in technology we're seeing. This is really just the front end, and I'll give you an example. 90% um, of all the data that's out there today was produced in the last two years, and it is increasing exponentially every year. All right. So in three years, we'll be a, a lot farther down the line with a lot more data and a lot more technology than we have today. And, and that means we'll be, we will have put into the dustbin technologies and things that exist today and have adopted new ones. Uh, so it's, it's hard in this continuum, as it was in the 1990s, to sort of grab onto something and say, that's the winner, I'm going to ride that horse, because you don't exactly know. Um, the, the one thing, though, I, I, I would pay attention to is, is blockchain, uh, because blockchain is either getting a good or bad rap because it's the underlying application uh, on a lot of cryptocurrencies. It's not cryptocurrency, but it's the underlying application on which it works, which is basically a peer-to-peer -peer verification system, meaning that you're moving and creating value based not upon the approval or the input of a financial intermediary, but you're doing it based on a proof-of-work standard that's being approved by peers. And, and the reason it works is because the proof of work standard and the approval by the peers is such a cumbersome process that you just cannot manipulate or replicate that chain. And so if you take the application away from cryptocurrencies and start applying it to lots of different things and transactions, you see that it has great applicability to an awful lot of transactions and um, Business, op business operations that we engage in today in a much different way. The bottom line of that is if you think that through and, and apply it to all these different things, uh, I think you begin to see that the role of financial, financial intermediaries changes in a peer-to-peer -peer environment. We live in an environment today, or you've come out of an environment, where there are intermediaries that approve and, and, and move transactions. When you move to a society where you're doing those things, same things in a peer-to-peer -peer environment, you've changed the role of financial intermediaries. And I'm not smart enough to know how they're going to change, but I do know that they're going to change. Uh, and I think a lot of large financial institutions believe the same thing. 
Uh, J.P. Morgan announced that it, th in 2019, it's got 50,000 people working on technology, 50,000. It also happens to have 60,000 working on compliance, 50,000 working on technology. They are spending $10.8 billion on technology. They are not going to be left behind in terms of whatever happens, because they understand that the role of financial, financial intermediation is changing. I mean, what Max Tegmark says in his book, Life 3.0, is if you take artificial general intelligence at its, at its face value, uh, at least in, in, in the world I came out of, why do we need associates in a law firm? The machines will do the research and thinking much better than the associates, and in fact, at some point, they'll replace the partners. So when you start thinking about who's replaceable, <laughs> it gets to be a pretty, uh, pretty interesting uh, dynamic. Uh, but the one thing I do know is that these technologies, um, what, 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 what I, if I were you, what I'd focus on is the underlying applications, not the products. What's the underlying application that's running that product and running that, uh, that business? And Because those are what's, what are going to survive. It's the digital signature um, uh, science of the 1980s and 90s that has survived to create blockchain. That's what to keep your eye on in terms of, of these new technologies. So uh, I, I suppose financial service firms are going to be going interstellar in the next 10 years. No, <laughs> uh, not to belabor. Um, but I, we want to turn now in the last 10 minutes or so to uh, a lightning round, um, and mainly um, just to give a forum for our, our distinguished panelists to talk a little bit about what's on their mind. But I want to turn it over to the SEC first, to uh, Elson, uh, for some of his thoughts in terms of uh, some activities going on with big data at the SEC. Yeah. I. I, I don't know if I'll say these are my worries or hopefully not the industry's worries, uh, but uh, you know, what do we do uh, with big data? SEC is a fundamentally uh, a legal and audit strong organization and that's how it's been and that's how it should be. But given all that we've talked about, it's not a surprise to anyone that we have some uh, coming up to speed to do. And that's part of the reason of SEC having quants, part of the reason of starting uh, groups like mine is to actually uh, catch up with the world as it is today. So we still have some catching up to do. That said, we've also uh, uh, done some catching up. So we are, um, uh, one of the things OC has done, uh, we have a uh, national exam analytics tool which takes trade blotters and uh, processes them and produces. And trade blotters, this is the standard SEC request, nothing new about it, it's been it's been requested for decades, but we are able to programmatically, rather than, you know, Alex here knows how to do something, let's feed it to a spreadsheet, we, we are trying to come up with better ways to handle those uh, questions, uh, draw some business insights, draw some understanding of the portfolio, as well as, uh, you know, look for potential violations in the data. So that's uh, happening. Um, as well, um, on the high-frequency side, we have a uh, lab called HAL, High Frequency Analytics Lab, and that takes tick data and message uh, level, and again, both with needs and HAL, the, the data could be big or it could be small, but one of our mandates is to not be intimidated by the size of the data. So if the industry is producing a billion uh, you know, trades in, in however much time interval, we have to, at some level, be able to process that. So uh, we're working towards that. And uh, uh, that's kind of what the SEC is doing. Great. Um, well, uh, why don't we go down the, the sort of row here and Tom, uh, parting shots in the last six minutes? Yeah, <laughs> I, I think I'd just close uh, this way by saying that, that I think it's obvious that data has become the most valuable asset on this planet. Um, and that's sort of a hard concept to grasp, but it, it, it's, it's attracting an awful lot of people who think there's an awful lot of money in data. And all you have to do is look at the large tech firms to understand that success story. Um, investment advisors used to get data about retail firms, for example, and about sales from putting spotters in cars in parking lots. Right? And you get some retail numbers about how many people shopped at Walmart this afternoon. Well, today it's done with drones. Um, there are, there's a company, SpaceNo, that uses 2.2 billion satellite observations 
uh, over 500,000 square kilometers in China to track 6,000 industrial facilities that are being built. I mean, the, the ability to gather that data and to use it is just absolutely phenomenal. Uh, but at the, and, and so the innovations that can derive from this are just mind-numbingly terrific. On the other hand, I think it's the regulators' jobs and it's our jobs in terms of running businesses to figure out what can go wrong. Because the one thing I know from practicing law for a very long time is that people called me because things went wrong. And they will go wrong. And the survivors in any business are going to be the people who understand what's going to go wrong and are ready for it. They're not going to be able to prevent it, but they're going to, I think, be ready to explain what happened and how it happened. Great. Um, well, and, and sensors, I think, are the, the other collection point, which is, yep, and, uh, and the sort of internet of things. Um, Katie, do you want to give your last Sure. Thoughts? So I uh, worry about the, the ethics. I mean, this is, hasn't hit our industry yet, but I work for a company that has, to, has insurance, um, a, a lot of insurance uh, business, and we use predictive analytics, and we use analytics based on anonymized data, et cetera, but we have to think really carefully about the biases we're embedding in our data. And, you know, the analysis you do in insurance, of course, is, you know, is there a disparate impact? Are you affecting a protected class? That hasn't hit our industry. That is, hasn't been tr t traditionally a concern in our industry. I wouldn't have ever thought of it had I not been working for an insurance company. But that's, that could also bleed its way into our, into our world. Also, uh, we joked about it earlier, but the fiduciary duty of machine learning tools. If you're creating a tool, the tool learns from you know, the, the data and the experience of others, and then that tool is making decisions, and those decisions are just deployed in client accounts. You know, are, are we discharging our fiduciary duty when we don't know what that tool is going to do because that tool is learning in an automated way? That's the future, but we have to think about where that is. The regulatory landscape to me is quicksand. You kind of have to hope you don't you know, come right, go right down and sink. So think back to the basics, compliance program, as Tom said, you know, what's your compliance program say? What are your disclosures? How did you try to mitigate? How did you try to test? Uh, what records did you keep? I mean, that's, that's really yeah. the basics here. It makes sense. And this probably goes without saying in the fiduciary business, but, you know, typically when we think about data in our shop, you know, obviously we're always thinking about the legal ramifications. We're thinking about the compliance ramifications. But then to your point, Katie, there's always that point where we say, does this feel right or not? Is this ethical or not? Do we understand that from the consumer's, customer, client's perspective, does this work? Um, James, final two minutes. Yep, thank you, Alex. So I'll, I'll leave you with just looking at this from a pure technology perspective. What we've seen in the last three decades has been exponential. You've heard the amount of data we're producing, the quantity, how it's being processed things are going to dramatically change, probably over the next 10 years, as a, at a personal guess. There's three companies out there, the IBMs of the world, the Googles and the Rigetti, which are out, based out of the East Bay, and they are currently working on the quantum physics of computing. Today, we can only compute so much data. That's the boundary for any scientists out there, Moore's law. That's the boundary which is holding everything back. Today, you'll hear and if you read many of the articles out there, particularly in a lot of scientific journals and the quantum physicists, once that supremacy, they call it, is reached and you can create a quantum stable state of processing data, the boundary of us being able to compute that data at the speed now, we can do in seconds with what the world's largest supercomputer can do in months now, and that's the big game changer. If you take the blockchain example, blockchain is great, it's secure, it's encrypted. If you can decode that encryption algorithm in the matter of seconds, security changes the way the world, world works. And that's why many of the government agencies, NASA, everyone else are truly investing now. And if you ever read into it, you'll see it's, it's a very different way. And that's why the cloud becomes so powerful. This is no longer computing. You can't buy a compu quantum computer and put it underneath your desk. It needs to be stored at zero Kelvin to keep all the, all the, the physics in place. But that is going to be what changes our, in our lifetimes over the next 10, 20 years, because we can now compute data at a speed we've never been able to see before. So. Let, me, let me just add one point, because James and Katie uh, touched on this, and I think it's important, uh, at least in terms of 
being fu futuristic, if we're being futuristic here, and, and that is that there's some who argue that the out reallocation of wealth among businesses and individuals will be based on the haves and have-nots in terms of who can afford big data and who can't. And you can see from some of the discussion we've had here, there is, there's a remarkable advantage to the predictability of the world when you have the big data uh, that will not be there if you don't have the big data. So it's sort of a have and have not discussion too, which gets into lots of other ethical and other areas uh, in terms of society. Well, on that cheery note, um, no. <laughs> I do want to thank our panelists and uh, thanks for sticking with us uh, for the presentation. <laughs>